My name's Dahlia Fisher. I'm the Director of External Relations for the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, and we are delighted that you're joining us for our third fascinating discussion in the series, A Global Response to the Holocaust with Irene Shaland. Uh, tonight, Irene will take us to the islands and the boot, Cuba, Calabria, Italy, Malta, and Corsica, as we embark on a journey through the painful past and often controversial present of how and why various nations around the world respond to Holocaust remembrance. So now we're ready to meet the one and only Irene Shaland, author of The Tao of Being Jewish and Other Stories, uh, which is notably available for sale in the Maltz Museum store. Um, at the store, by the way, is open by appointment. Should you want a private appointment in the store, um, just email wbain at mmjh.org and pick up your copy of The Tao of Being Jewish and Other Stories, among other wonderful uh, Judaica and artisan items. Um, but Irene is an internationally published art and travel writer, Jewish historian and educator. We're so lucky to have her with us tonight. Her research publications and lectures are focused on the multiple issues illuminating diaspora identity, the rich tapestry of global Jewish experiences, culture and heritage. She also writes and presents on the global response to the Holocaust. She's a regular presenter at such organizations as the ADL, Hidden Child Foundation, NAHOS, Holocaust Resource Center of New Jersey, the New York Center for Jewish History Research, Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, among others. Irene's been lecturing here with us at the Maltz Museum since 2014, and we're thrilled that she's here with us again tonight. Welcome, Irene. Let's get the program started. Thank you. Thank you, Dalia. It's always been my great pleasure and honor to work with and for the Maltz Museum. Great team, great museum, great programs, always. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming over to spend this um, four to five hours with us. Hope you brought your midnight snack. If not, we will we'll manage it in a much shorter time. So what we're going to do today we will follow the same framework as we did in our part one, uh, Austria, Hungary, Germany, and the Soviet Union. And in our part two, when we moved from Central Europe to Scandinavia and then to Asia, we will look at the country in all uh, countries' complexity and contradictions to better appreciate the region, its history, and its people. And then, will incorporate Jewish narrative into this larger background, moving toward from the past, which is always present in places like Malta or Calabria, and from the past to World War II to see what role, what response to this catastrophic event in world history this country uh, in discussion had and uh, then to the present, because there is always a great question of why. So what? What we as people living in the 21st century, as Americans and as Jews, what's in it for us? What can we learn from Jews of Cuba, from the Maltese Jewish story, from Corsican or from Calabrian? So we will start with Cuba, which is separated from us by the longest 90 miles in the world. I call Cuba the chosen island after Marisa Gonzalez's wonderful book dedicated to her Cuban childhood in which she stated to be Cuban and to be Jewish, it's to be twice survivors. And Cuba is quite an unusual place. A continent more than an island, less a nation, more than approximation. It's from my favorite book about Cuba, The Boys from Dolores by Patrick Simmers. Just look at that. Cuba, Cuba has, uh, contains half the land and people of the entire Caribbean. And the area is immense, 47 thousand square miles stretched over 746 miles east to west. And it's home to the largest cities and busiest harbors in the entire 
Caribbean, and Cuba always thought of itself to be at the center of the world, or at least at the crossroads of the world. And Cuba always was welcoming refuge for the Jews since the Edict of Expulsion in 1492. And from the first crypto-Jewish or secret Jews converted to Christianity, crypto-Jewish settlers in Cuba in the late 15th century to the synagogues of Havana, which is the most photographed Jewish uh, place probably in the Caribbean right now, at least uh, for most of the tourists, not coming from the US who could not visit Cuba right now officially. Uh, the Cuban Jewish experience manifests a complex journey, especially if you looked at it um, against the background of this country 500 years, fascinating history. Cuban Jewish experience as many minorities experience, uh, many facts reflect struggle of survival through assimilation and acculturation. But what's unique about Cuba is that it's Jewish narrative based on a story depicting not a single community, but rather a mosaic of several, actually five different communities that varied greatly in their culture and their language. And this mosaic was built over 500 years, over five, through five distinctly different uh, waves of crypto-Jewish uh, immigrations. So we'll start with the crypto-Jewish story with my favorite uh, <laughs> survival is our new religion here and we have nothing else if not our fear. And as I tell to everyone going to Cuba, make sure you visit Santiago, not Havana, not even Trinidad, but Santiago, because this is where Cuban history began, including Jewish history. Columbus landed just 200 kilometers to the east in October of, of 1492. And who was the first Jew of the Americas? There is no documented evidence that points to the arrival of the Jews, first Jews in Cuba, but it does not matter because people's historic self-understanding means much more than mere facts. And so it's in popular opinion that the first Jew in Cuba, actually the first European in Cuba was a converser Louis de Torres. What we know about him is that he was born Yosef Ben Levi Havri and he served as a translator from Hebrew for the governor of Murcia, which is a large, the large province in Spain between Andalusia and Valencia. Well, um, when Columbus was getting ready to discover America for us, he thought he would encounter Asian people or lost tribes of Israel. So the knowledge of Hebrew and Aramaic seemed to be absolutely indispensable. And he offered job to Yosef Ben Levi, he took it and to get the employment, he immediately converted to Christianity. Uh, he sailed with Columbus on Santa Maria. Actually conversion took place right on the ship. He did it not only because of the attractive job, but also to avoid the inquisition after the edict of expulsion. His life enveloped in legends. What we know for sure about him, that he would send with the first group on the island, because if you encounter lost tribe of Israel or Asian people, they would speak Hebrew. And he was the one who documented strange customs of the native, of drying the leaves, putting in their tubes, burning them and whew, inhaling the smoke. We also know that his widow received very substantial pension from the royal treasury, uh, treasury for his services to the crown. And the rest is legends. He became, he stayed in Cuba, became very wealthy landlord, owner, known throughout West Indians, or he went back to Hispaniola and died within a year. He is also attributed pronouncing the very first address to the natives in Hebrew, of course, the language they should have understand. In his book, The uh, 
Sales of Hope by Simon Wessensal, he is supposedly to talk to the native in Hebrew. So the first speech in the America so was the one in Hebrew. Most probably he did nothing of the sort in this Hebrew speech was invention of the book writers. There were many converses that followed the Taurus, but little known about them on their ancestry. We also know that moving into new colonies places new converses, crypto Jews, further away from the clutches of the Inquisition. And in, at some point, I think it was 1516, when Inquisition prohibited immigration of new Christians to the islands, but it was overlooked because authorities on the islands did need new people. What we know about Inquisition in Cuba that was not nearly as aggressive and as vicious as it was on the mainland or even throughout the rest of West Indies was for sure that the inquisitors in Cuba were after big bucks. The documented few cases of the burnings of the Judaizers and it was the worst crime under for the Inquisition. They were the richest people in West Indies and a lot of money was pocketed by the Inquisition. The Holy Office in Cuba was abolished only in the 19th century. And until the end of the Spanish-American War, it was 1898, any religious services, any services at all, with the exception of those of the Catholic Church were forbidden. So what happened to these converses? What they more wanted most of all is to melt into the population, blend with Spaniards and disappear into Cuba. And they did. So jumping to the 20th century Jewish story and that I call the island within the island. Again, Santiago de Cuba, only there we can understand the roots of the contemporary Jewish narrative of Jewish history of Cuba and Cuban history. Teddy Roosevelt comes there with his cavalry, he attacks and captures Santiago and ends successfully Spanish domination in Cuba, bringing final victory to the Cuban War of Independence. And Next slide. Okay. So the real first real Jews to settle in the islands were Americans. And many came for the brand new great business opportunities, and among them were many Jews. Uh, they most of them did not speak Spanish. Most of them did not care much about human politics or history. And they thought of themselves first and foremost as Americans. And they wanted to duplicate their life in the United States. They built American schools and American golf courses and American houses. And in 1906, they bought the land and built the first congregation, the first Cuban synagogue, and then the cemetery. So this years, 1906, 1904, that's the beginning of Cuban Jewish community, American Jewish community to be precise. And these American Jews built their own very comfortable, very close American culture island within the island of Cuba. Now, other waves of Jewish immigrations. In the beginning of the 20th century, Sephardic wave. And let me remind you that Sephardat means Spain and Sephardic Jews are those Jews that were fleeing the Inquisition, fleeing the edict of expulsion to the countries that were then kind and benevolent to them, like uh, under the crown of Ottoman Turks. They spoke Ladina, medieval uh, Spanish mixed with uh, contemporary languages, and they had Sephardic Jews had very easy time to acclimate in their new home country culturally uh, and linguistically and they built their own secluded corner. They had nothing to do with American Jews coming over in 1902, but uh, their own corner, their own island was deeply rooted in strict traditions and in religion. S soon after come Palacos, not 
all of them were from Poland. There were Jew Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenaz means Europe. So um, we call Ashkenazi Jews those that ended up in Europe and their culture is European rather than uh, Middle Eastern or Eastern, God for Sephardic. Uh, they were escaping violent pogroms in Russia and Poland, but the locals called them Palakas and it stuck. Ashkenazis never saw Cuba as their home. They never adjusted it. For them, it was just a stopover on the way to the US. If you spend less than a year in Cuba, you get your Cuban uh, certificates, you can apply for American visa and go to America. And 99% of them did. They even had an Yiddish, I can't pronounce Yiddish, but it's meant Hotel Cuba. It was just a stopover. But in 1924, this Cuban loophole was closed. So what Ashkenazis had to do, uh, Temporary, as it often in Cuba, becomes permanent. They had to adjust to the countries they didn't know, to the climate they were not prepared for, and they built their own secluded island. There was almost no interactions between Sephardim and Ashkenazi and between American Jews that came in the beginning of the century. So we have islands within the island. Come 1930s, economic downturn was a cause, some of the causes for Cuban xenophobia, nationalism and anti-Semitism undoubtedly fueled by the Nazi Germans consulate in Havana. And that was one of the main reasons for the tragic voyage of the transcontinental liner, St. Louis. You know, 979 Jews on this liner were escaping Nazi Germany. They were not allowed to disembark in, uh, in Miami, they were not allowed to disembark in Havana, they were sent back to their certain uh, deportation and death. But then in a few years, situation changed. We all know about St. Louis and it's often associated with Cuba forever. But there was something else. Batista came into power and he had his own problems. He didn't care at all about immigration. And the fifth and the last wave of Jewish immigration to Cuba happens at that time. Between 1933 and 1944 or 45, different sources give diff different numbers, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 of European Jews were able to come. To Cuba. Half of them were from Austria and Germany. The other half mostly from Holland and Belgium. And this uh, Dutch and Belgium Jews negotiated with Cuban government to start brand new industry, diamond polishing. Alexis and mine, two wonderful friends, Judy Grace, she's a dancer, and Robin Trusdale, a filmmaker, they made the movie based on archival materials and on the personal Judy Cray story, whose mother was a child in Havana. It's called Cuba's Forgotten Jewels, a heaven in Havana, about this diamond industry. Within a year, and this remind, uh, no, these people couldn't bring anything with them. It was what they remembered. So they, within a year, built diamond polishing uh, uh, factories, over 20 of them throughout the island. Only thanks to their personal connections, they were able to bring in diamonds from South Africa through New York, polish them, send it to New York. So it was very successful industry. Thousands, thousands people were employed, not just Jewish immigrants. Cuba, who was in almost an economic collapse at this time. So Jews became upper middle class by the end of the war. Most of this fifth wave immigrants left, probably less than 15% stayed. So after the war, we have jury in Cuba divided into three large sectors. It's Americans, uh, other Ashkenazi from uh, Russia and Poland and Sephardic. And each community kept to themselves. They lived as a separate entity. They built very successful, prosperous, comfortable island of their own. And they wanted these islands to last forever. But then Cuban revolution happened. And I wanted to ask you if you can tell me who was the most famous Jew in Cuba. And I wish I could see your faces because some people would say Che Guevara and said, no, yeah, look, look at him. For me, he looks 
angry Jewish or Jewishly angry. And I always remember my Polish grandmother who would say, yeah, Irochka, he's not really Jewish, but he has an intelligent face. So what's interesting about this brutal dictator, he was a very complicated person. He admitted on many occasions that though his friends, his contemporaries, admired strong men of the 1930s like Mussolini or Hitler, he could never do that. He could never be against the Jews because it's in his own words, he himself was one coming from Jewish grandmothers from Canary Islands and Galicia. Interesting guy, oh good, oh, goodness. So what happens? Again, since Santiago can come to his monument and talk about his legacy of the brutal totalitarian regime and many contradictions. Uh, what Fidel did, he uh, recreated the calendar. The year of his revolution, 1959, stopped to exist. It was the year of the revolution and the years that followed were called Epoch of Triumph. The constitution was abolished and mind you, in Cuba was one of the most liberal constitutions with the freedom to religion, all religions, uh, must have one of the best constitutions in Latin America. It was abolished, new constitution written in which Cuba became atheist communist state in which any religious observance, any observance of any religion became the highest cr uh, criminal offense and this few events fueled the exodus of the prosperous Jewish communities. And now I say plural, there were over 15,000 Jews in Cuba, they left. And within a few years, Jewish communities stopped to exist. Those less than a thousand, mostly in Havana, those that stayed had once again as Jews did for 2000 years to adjust, adjust to brutal totalitarian regime, adjust to deprivations and rationing and to vicious anti-Israeli attacks. And Castro broke up with the Jewish state after um, uh, the six days war. And it often was written that was under pressure of the Soviet Union. Most likely he was under pressure of his own ambitions. He wanted to become the chairperson of uh, the uh, non-aligned movement whose non-negotiable condition for their chairman. And that was a group of Arab and African countries. And their condition was chairman should severe any ties with the Jewish states. But what's interesting, Castro's attitude toward the Holocaust. Even when he expressed the most vicious hostility toward Israel and attacked Israel with insulting and falsified references, he also blasted Holocaust deniers. And after the breakup of the Soviet Union, talking to American press or Canadian press, he often stated, Jews are blamed for, uh, and slandered for everything. No one had ever been more slandered than the Jews. The Jews have lived in existence that is much harder than ours. There is nothing that compares to the Holocaust. And that's quite interesting. At the same time, even now, Isaac Bajewi Zinger and Ellie Weissel, Anna Frank, all these books are banned in Cuba. And we know that in Cuba, Abu Nudal, this famous terror, infamous terrorist trained in Cuba. But at the same time, attitude toward how asks quite remarkable. So a foundation of life in Cuba, even now, even more now in COVID is Libretta, which is rationing car. And uh, everything is rationed because che, uh, che Guevara and Fidel, they knew exactly where their countrymen have to live, where they have to work, and what and how much they had to live. So you get six pounds of uh, kilograms of rice a month, two kilograms of sugar, and never ever meat. It was rarity, it was a treasure. And when meat was available, it was pork, Jews don't let pork. So the uh, few hundred Jews that stayed in Havana kept the synagogues living and going. Uh, they were registered as Jewish community and every Friday 
they had beef. The only kosher store in Cuba survived the years of imposed atheism and persecutions for religious observances, but it never closed the door. And when we visited Cuba a couple years ago, it probably was with the most photographed kosher store in the world, and it's just a little hole in the wall. And uh, the shop never stopped supplying kosher beef to the Jews of Havana. Why? Was it because uh, Fidel destroyed Jewish community of Cuba and he felt bad about it, or because of his admitted Jewish ancestry? Like everything in Cuba, there is never a straight answer. So the 21st century started much earlier in Cuba, about 20 years, oh, 12 years earlier. You know why? With the breakup of the Soviet Union. This ever watching pain for everything big brother just disappeared and it immediately led to the total economic collapse. Transportation, agriculture were uh, in catastrophic ruin. So Fidel, who never was lost for words, called it special period at the time of peace. But at the same time, he and his brother began to realize they have to turn the economy, turn the country from the reliance on the Soviets to the reliance on tourism, meaning American tourism, meaning American Jewish tourism. Constitution was ad uh, uh, adapted to that. And the atheistic state stopped to exist. It became pluralistic. A secular state, religious observances were allowed, period of religious conciliation began, Cubans could go to their cathedrals or to the synagogue, they got their Christmas back, and the Jews could go back to being Jews. So that was a little miracle. There is a Holocaust memorial in Santa Clara, just a few steps away of the world famous memorial to Che Guevara. For us, our entrance into Jewish Cuba started in an unusual place. It was a Jewish hotel called Hotel Rachel. And it used to be beautiful Art Nouveau buildings that came into total disrepair. Well, Castro's government restored it, turned it to the hotel and seamlessly integrated beautiful Jewish motifs into Art Nouveau motifs. It looks like art museum. And there is a little Holocaust memorial there. There are three synagogues in Gawana that were never closed, but now they were rebuilt with the help of the community overseas. By the way, this, those Cubans that left Cuba stopped being uh, enemies, they became Cuban community in the exterior. So they could send money, they could come and visit their relatives. The synagogues were rebuilt with the joint money, American Joint Distribution Committee, and donations from Miami and Houston and New York. And in one of the uh, synagogues, Central Hebrew Sephardi, the only Sephardic institution now in Cuba, is a small museum dedicated to Holocaust. Very often when I show, in my, when I talk about Cuba and I show my opening slide and you saw the entrance to the main synagogue, Patronato, there are always people in the audience who said, I was bad mitzvah there. My parents were married there and it's a Patronato meets Patrons. It was synagogue built, uh, cost a lot of money, donated in, uh, before Cuban revolution in early 1950s by Cuban Jews. It went to disrepair, and now it's the most visited synagogue in the world for the purpose of taking pictures and see how it's going. Cuban uh, Jewish community experienced this unexplained ascent, you know, becoming celebrity of tropical diaspora. And anywhere in the synagogue, you will see pictures of Fidel coming to the synagogue. And it happened that if you, uh, I wish I could see your faces. There are always people who visited Patronata and met Adela Dworkin, that's president of Jewish community of unidentified age, a little bit over 60, but a little bit less than 85, with huge energy. And in one of the high level meetings, she said, Comrade Fidel, why you never come to the synagogue? You never invited me, said the dictator. Well, she said, come and help us celebrate Hanukkah. He asked, what's Hanukkah? And Adela said, 
Oh, it's a revolutionary holiday for the Jews. So everywhere, all over the world, were pictures of Fidel helping Jews to celebrate their revolutionary holidays. We met with David Princeton, who is now president of the community, and he explained a lot that this 1,100 people who consider themselves Jewish. It's a community in a flux. Many young people do live for Israel, the US, or Australia, but there are many people who come to Patronato and ask, how can I become a Polacco? Because they think they were Jewish, or maybe they want to become, to be part of something bigger than themselves. And uh, what was surprising for us, that the Jews of Cuba survived Inquisition, they survived Castro Revolution, but they reinvented themselves now as a one single community. They powerful not in numbers, but in their spirit. They very optimistic about the future. So, so what? What can we learn, remember from Cuba? from Cuban story. It's a complex journey. Nothing is simple, especially if you look at the background of 500 years of Cuban history. Uh, and it was built by five very different waves of crypto-Jewish and Jewish immigration. The extraordinary characteristic, at least for Alex and I, this characteristic of Jewish narrative in Cuba is the fundamental sense of community now. They're not separate islands. They're one very strong community that survived almost complete dissolution after uh, Castro's revolution in years of imposed terror and uh, uh, atheism. But uh, what happening over the last years of the 20th century now, they ascended into becoming what I call celebrity of tropical diaspora. In relations response to Holocaust, it's little known story of thousands of refugees finding safe haven in Cuba. We all know about uh, St. Louis, we don't know about the Jews of Havana. And now we can go to Malta. And if you look at the map that Alex created, he even made Malta more visible. Unfortunately, I can't show you where it is, but just look, it's a little bit uh, under Sicily. It's teeny tiny speck in the middle of Mediterranean. But don't be fooled by Malta's size. This tiny country, this nation of 400,000 people, they uh, have astonishingly rich history that goes back 7,000 years ago and that manifests an extraordinary Jewish story. And all this history is packed into tiny islands of Malta, Goza, and Camina, because Malta is not just Malta, it's island of Malta, island of Goza, and island of uh, Camina. And Malta was able to absorb influences of every major power in history, Phoenicians, Greeks, Romans, uh, then uh, Arabs and uh, Normans and Schwabians and Angevins and uh, Spaniards. Everything was inside this Maltese culture, absorbed into Maltese culture. And Maltese history, and especially Maltese Jewish history, manifest a trajectory that's still under the radar for most historians. But what we see there, that from the Phine Israelis, ancient Israelites, sailing to Malta with Phoenicians 3,000 years ago. Then you have first Jewish tourist, I call him Biblical Saint Paul, who arrives in Malta in the first century of Common Era. Then you have slavery, Jewish slavery during Renaissance in Malta, under the during Knights of St. John rule, and to today's tiny, the smallest in the Mediterranean, very active very uh, and blossoming Jewish community. It's very, very interesting. And to understand it, we have to travel through all layers of Maltese history because that's the only way to see what Malta is all about. And uh, uh, this 
it has secrecies and surprises and great joy that experienced over these years up to contemporary community by the Jews of Malta. Well, in 1928, the paper was read for the Jewish Historical Society in England by Cecil Ross, a talented historian, and he quoted British Naval Admiral Lord Fisher, neither Jews nor rats can exist in Malta. The Maltese are too much for either. And then with the tongue in his cheek, uh, Ross said, well, the Admiral had much better knowledge of zoology, meaning rats, than of history, meaning Jews, because Jewish presence in Malta goes back time immemorial. And for Jewish history enthusiasts to uncover the story, we have to go through Malta and its history and walk it and live it and breathe it. So we will travel through history beginning with prehistory. And that's a fascinating period. It starts with 5200 BCE and goes to 800 BCE until Phoenicians colonized Malta. And it's a period that began with the arrival of man in the Maltese islands and the appearance of this massive, enigmatic, strange, beautiful temples that all over islands of Malta and uh, Goza, who were these people who created these temples. Most probably they came from Sicily. They most probably had contacts, trade contacts with Sicilians. But what's absolutely certain, archaeology is certain that this very sophisticated, artistic, and peaceful culture was created in total isolation. It's typical Maltese. This temple is considered to be the oldest man-made structures on earth, much older than Stonehenge. Uh, at least 1,000 years older than pyramids of Giza. Well, why do we care? Because in one of these temples on the island of Goda, uh, we can find that was considered until recently the evidence of ancient Israelites coming to go to the islands of Malta with uh, Phoenicians. And that's Jantija temple called by the locals, meaning the temple of built by the giants. And you can see island, small, small and quiet island of Goda where this temple is. And in this temple in 1912, two are female archeologists and one was named Mrs. Cleveland, how interesting. They found this inscription in the temple right in front of the Southern apse, And it's written in ancient Hebrew and Phoenician alphabet to the love of our father and then the name of God. Did ancient Israelites came to Malta with Phoenicians and then uh, sizzled the, uh, their prayer into, chiseled into stone using Phoenician alphabet? Uh, you might be disappointed that the current position of the heritage of Malta, which is supreme, authority, it's like our Smithsonian, only more academic, it's supreme authority on everything concerning history of Malta. Very recently, their position changed and it's considered to be 19th century forgery. Forgery or not, but it's uh, almost certainty that ancient Israelites sailed with Phoenicians to Malta. Uh, it most probably was a prosperous tribe of Usher, and seafaring tribe, tribe of Zebulun, who were uh, marine traders, just like Phoenicians, and their symbol was a ship. So as soon as you left Gentian, you found this plate, this stone with an Israeli prayer, you moved from prehistory to history proper or recorded history that began with the Phoenicians and lasted until the Roman conquest of uh, the archipelago of Malta. And here you see the image of the ship that was a symbol of uh, Zebulum tribe. So who were the Phoenicians? There were Semitic people who lived where now Israel and Lebanon. They were great marine time traders and they discovered and mapped uh, Mediterranean islands. They settled sea, uh, coastal cities like Palermo in Sicily 
or Medina, they call it Malas in Malta. So, uh, they actually invented the alphabet and that's their greatest gift of literacy. And you know, thanks to the Phoenicians and to Hebrews who came with them, Maltese language is Semitic. It's the only Semitic language that uses Latin alphabet. And it's the only language, Semitic language, that is a fish, one of the official languages of the European Union. So from Phoenicians, we're jumping to Roman period with the first Jewish tourist, biblical Saint Paul. I'm solely Jew born in Tarsus. And he was shipwrecked in Malta in year 60, 60 of common era. He persuaded the governor and most of the people convert to Christianity and considered the spiritual father of uh, Malta, of the nation. And uh, Maltese are very religious people. It's a Catholic country. They have 365 churches. You can go to different church every day of the year. We wanted to see catacombs. In Roman times, there could not be any burials within the city limits, so the dead were buried outside the city. That's catacombs of St. Paul near, near Rabat, it's a small city, uh, suburb of Medina, the ancient capital. And this is where you can see lots of uh, Jewish symbols, menorahs, and even you see on the right, uh, at the bottom of the slide on the right is Zebulon image. Medieval period in Malta starts with Arabs domination 870 and ends with the Knights of St. John coming into Ireland. And coming into Medina, this is where during Middle Ages, Jews constituted over 30%. And you come to Jewish quarter, it was not a ghetto lock from outside. It was a free area where Jews liked to live next to their core religionists. It had synagogue, it had all Jewish silk market, and Jewish community there was very prosperous until the total dissolution of Jewish community after the edict of expulsion. And the Jews either left Malta or those who stayed convert to Catholicism and disappeared into the population. We went to see ancient Jewish documents and cathedral archives, the oldest of which dates to the 1300s. And we were told by our friends there, the chief archivist, that these Jews who wrote these documents and they were written in Hebrew, but in colloquial Maltese, only in Malta it could happen. The Jews still there, they in Malta, they lie in peace in the Kalkara ancient cemetery. When you look at the sign on the wall, English translation reads, the cemetery was established by the Lancom Fund for ransoming Hebrew slaves at its own expense for burial of the dead of the race. Slaves, it was an eye opener. So what's happening? The period of the Order of the Knights of Malta and the Jewish slavery. In 15 cities, uh, islands of Malta given by the uh, Carlos Quintus, Charles V of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor to the Knights of Malta. They had to pay rent only of one white Maltese falcon to the emperor and another one to the uh, crown's viceroy of Sicily. And the cheap rent, uh, rent came with strings attached. They had to turn Malta into impenetrable wall to the strongest shield against the Ottoman Turks. And they did. And what was happening that the knight's favorite pastime was never season warfare in the sea, little distinguishable from piracy. They would capture the ship, grab everyone there captive, bring to Malta, sell them into slavery and waiting for um, ransom to be negotiated and paid. They did not target Jews as Jews specifically, but there were many Jewish merchants sailing Mediterranean. So during the Knights of Malta, there was never season flow of Jewish slaves. And actually it's a strange phenomena. During the uh, rule of Knights of Malta, the only Jews on the island, Jewish community was entirely slave community. Jewish world had to respond the, to this new normal. 
and the new organization be, uh, came into being, headquartered in Venice, uh, Italy, and in Amsterdam, and it was called the Federation, the Organization for the Ransoming of Jewish Captive. And I found translation of Passova Haggadah in 17th century Venice, published in 17th century. We were horsemen slaves in Malta. And the only free Jews that could come in Malta, they needed permission from Grand Master of the Order and then could come and leave only through these gates, the Jews' sally port that exists today. You can't spend even a day in Malta without hearing about this great victory in 1565. Nothing is better known than the siege of Malta, said Voltaire. And that was brilliant victory. Uh, achieved by the Knights over the Ottoman Turks that really changed the tide of history in Europe. And Jews behaved very bravely and fought against the Turks, even though there were strong circulated rumors that they financed the Ottoman invasion. Well, nothing new about that. We went to see uh, the Museum of Ethnography to talk to its chief curator, Ken Kassar, about Inquisition in Malta. And you see, it was uh, Rome, uh, was a physician from Rome. It was Italian, it was not Spanish. And it's a huge difference. They, were, they issued very few death sentences, probably over the years of the existence, there were less than five. And only few Jewish slaves were taken to inquisition because of not Judaizing, but of blasphemy and drunkenness. But this is where we learn in this museum in the in, uh, Palace of Great Inquisitor about the most remarkable personality in Malta during the time of slavery. It was Giuseppe Coin, who was slave Jew, Italian Jew, um, waiting to be ransomed, and at the same time working in a tavern where uh, in, in slaves could work during the day on money, but then they can had to come to slave prison. Uh, he overheard what Turkish slaves were talking about and they were planning huge uh, revolt that would end Malta uh, domination in the Mediterranean. And if so coin came to Grandmaster, told about the plot, uh, there are uh, all these rebels were caught and the plot never happened. And uh, what happened to Joseph Coyne, he was given huge pension and of course freedom and a remarkable uh, mention in the main street of uh, Malta. And we could see in archeology span museum, this uh, uh, marble beautiful thing you know, that says that this uh, mention was given to Giuseppe Antonio Coin, and then see Neofito. Neofita means new converser. Our coin was not a Jew anymore, and everybody could see it, that he was a Jew, Jewish, not a Jew, but Christian merchant, and they could trust uh, coin the merchant. So the slavery ends with Napoleon, 1798. Napoleon comes, he abolishes the slavery, gives Jews all the human rights, and uh, it, he uh, banishes the order. So they don't think that uh, Knights of Malta ever thought about disappearing from history. They alive and well have beautiful headquarters in Rome. But for the Jews of Malta, Napoleon's laws meant that they can reconstitute, rebuild Maltese Jewish community and now is free people. In two years, Napoleonic wars uh, you know, end with defeat. The British come from 1800 through 1964, Malta was under British. For the Jews, it meant that they would be arriving in growing numbers from countries, Gibraltar, England, Italy, Morocco, Portugal, Tripoli, Tunis, and Turkey, and the current Jewish community goes back to that time. What happened during the war? I mentioned the great siege of Malta in the 16th century. In 1914, 1942, in history, it's called the second siege of Malta because Malta was very important base for allies between and uh, Churchill even called it unsinkable ship because who rules Malta means could prevent 
Nazi Italian domination in North Africa. And it led to incredible, the hardest bombardment in history that Malta suffered. And you know, within four miles of the Grand Harbor, the population density was more than six times that of the island average. And over 23,000 people lived in the area less than a quarter of a mile. It was heavily bombarded. People could not leave their bomb shelter for days to find water or food. And at the same time, they opened their hearts and their houses for the Jews coming from Europe. And that's an unknown story. Malta as a heaven during the Holocaust. We know about Shanghai, political anomaly, free port, the only city in the world that didn't require visa. Well, Malta was the only country, the only region in the world that didn't require visas. And there was never exact number how many thousands of Jews were saved, only mention of the thousands. And Malta now a country that commemorates it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The first one was held just a year ago in the uh, president's palace. And the speaker was director of the Anne Frank Center in Berlin. Thousands, thousands of European Jews were saved in Malta. And the story is mm -hmm. not published and not known. So current uh, synagogue exists in a small apartment and it's a beautiful synagogue with beautiful Torahs and Re, uh, Ruben Ahayan is the most uh, illustrious leader. He's not a rabbi. He, he actually is a spiritual leader of the community, the great person. And they have a Hebrew school with 60 people. They're our future, he says. And in this note, we can go to a different island. We'll come to Corsica. Another enigma, also not researched, little understood, and little visited island. Uh, this wild island, wrote French writer Guy de Maupassant, is more unknown, more distant to us in America, even though you can see it from the coast of France, and nothing much changed over the years. And that's unfortunate. For many people, they don't even know Corsican history, that Corsica is part of France, but they don't want to be part of France. Or the Jewish history of Corsica, they think Corsica has none to reveal. They don't know that from 10 to 15,000 of Jews, most of them from Southwest France, were saved by uh, Corsicans during the war. And it was due to their generous heart, always open to those who seek refuge from persecution and cruelty and death and the secret power of Amerta. Amerta is a code of silence for mafia that tells you under any circumstances, you should never ever cooperate with authorities. An entire island did not. It's incredibly beautiful island. We were falling in love with it, with every turn of the wheel of our rental car, called it the most beautiful marina probably in the world. Bonifacio, we left our heart there. And the first tourist was Omer, who described it in Odyssey. It's incredible beauty. The Corsican history from the bird eye view is, could be, very brief, but it's very rich. Starts with prehistory, with megalithic menhirs, and menhir is a man-made uh, vertical slab of stone, like Stonehenge. Except in Corsica, they all have faces. They are statue menhirs. They have different faces, and they armed. In the 11th century, Corsica was granted to Pisa by the Pope. In a hundred years, Corsica was divided between Pisa and its arch rival and of Genoa, and Genoa stayed for over 500 years until in 1755, Pascal Paoli, called the father of the nation, founded the Democratic Republic of Corsica that lasted only 14 years. So the only period that Corsicans were free from any foreign power. Well, when Italians, officially relinquished any claims to Corsica, they, hist they secretly sold it to France. And France stayed. Now Corsica is part of France. And the symbol of Corsican independence was from uh, Paoli 
made it uh, as a flag of Democratic Republic of Corsica is Morse hat. And it's a strange symbol. By its curious wink of history was brought by conquering uh, by the conquerors, Aragonese in the 1300s, they wanted to brag about their victories over the Moors in Spain, and this white bandana was over the eyes of the young man. But now it's up, and it's a symbol of free Corsica. We went to Filitosa, which is managed by our friends and owners, and this is where you can see this watchful meniers that can people who build it this Chardin, the warriors coming from Sardinia, fiercely independent ancestors of today's Corsica. And to understand this island, to understand the Jewish narratives, what made Corsicans, Corsicans, how they came to be the people who always were so welcoming to the Jews and saved thousands of them and other unknown stories. You have to go to Corta. We are Corsicans by birth and sentiment. As Corsican, we wish to be neither slaves nor rebels. Either we shall be free or we shall be nothing. Uh, wrote Paola, and you can see on the map where Cors uh, Corta is located. And no other places in the islands offer such an in-depth understanding of the island itself, its history, and mindset of its people. And here you can see the fathers of Corsican independence. And on the right is Jean Pierre Gafori, who was an MD, was a doctor uh, by training and education. And he led Corsican army, liberating most of the island until he was killed himself in the ambush. And behind him is his house. And you can see the marks of the Genoese bullets. When you circle his monument, you can see this bronze reliefs of different scenes of his life. His wife, Faustina, is a national hero. She was fighting next to him. And during one episode, as the legend said, when their son was captured by the Italians and used as a shield, the uh, Corsicans hesitated. And so she yelled, don't think about my son, think about your country. Now, she was not a Jewish mother, I think. Well, pa Pascal Paoli comes into scene in 1755 and he liberates Corsica. He establishes the Democratic Republic, writes its constitution, establishes full rights for women and the Jews. Corsica was the first country in the world proclaiming full freedom for the Jews, 1763, 27 years before the United States, 28 years before France. And it was Pascal Paoli father of the nation, and Corte is a symbol of the island, and the citadel was the university that he founded that lived not much lo uh, longer than the Republic, was closed by the French, and opened only in the 1980s. And as you see in the right is the entrance to the pal National Palace when independent state was born. And here we come to the Corsican Jewish narrative. Again, an unknown story. When Pascal Paoli proclaimed the Jews have the same rights as Corsicans because they share the same faith. And he, um, it's a long story. They were not the first Jews that pa Paoli invited to come to the island to help to build the economy after 500 years of foreign domination. There were Jews coming in ninth century from Egypt. In the 15th century, from the south of Italy after Edict of Expulsion, after wild, violent pogroms in Padua, in the end of the 17th, all of them were taken by Corsicans. They stayed on the island and they disappeared into Ireland. They assimilated, they intermarried, they made it home. And what stayed the names like Gabriele, Jacobi, Padavani from Padua, Rossi, Simeoni, they bear the legacy of those settlers. And Corsicans are sure that Jewish story is part of Corsican soul, that most Corsicans, uh, they say about 30%, some say most, they have Jewish ancestry. Paoli invited Jews to come mostly from Livorno, from uh, uh, Italy and from Catalonia in Spain. We know for sure that he founded Le Il Rus, this little city. It was a new port near Calvi. 
and he wanted the juices he wrote to settle among us and granted them all the rights as Corsicans. And this juice also that seen assimilated. So now we will go to uh, Ajasho and to Napoleon, another great champion of the Jews, who told his doctor in St. Helena, I wanted to free the Jews to make them full citizens. I inst insisted that they be treated as brothers, since we all are heirs to Judaism. He was born in Ajasho, beautiful city, capital of the island, birthplace of Napoleon, everything on Joshua about him, including his mansion where he was born. And I absolutely cannot let you leave a Joshua without coming to uh, the Palace Fash, which is Museum of Fine Arts, which was the museum and the uh, palace owned by Napoleon's uncle, Cardinal Joseph Fash, great collector of art. Just six years older than Napoleon, he first was very close to his ambitious nephew and proud and very supportive of him. But then they broke up. Why? Because of the Jews. Do you know, said the Cardinal, the Holy Scriptures predict the end of the world when the Jews are recognized as belonging to Christian nation as equals. And for the Jews, Napoleon is a great champion who in the wake of Napoleonic Wars as it says in many Jewish uh, studies, he brought the walls of ghettos down, liberated the Jews of Western uh, Europe. So what's happened in the 20th century? And it's a different story. At Joshua again, it's only fitting that that would become safe haven for the Jews during World War I, the uh, city where Napoleon was born. A Joshua port begins uh, uh, entrance to new safe life for the Jewish refugees. There were about <coughs> 1,000 of them. Uh, they came from French Monday territories like Syria, Lebanon, because the world where they were safe and prosperous, the Ottoman Empire was falling apart. The French allowed them to come to France, but not exactly. They sent them to what was considered the island of poverty and misery to Corsica. Uh, and once again, as they did over a thousand of years, Corsicans, in sight of deprivation and poverty, opened their wallets, their hearts to new immigrants. They built very comfortable dormitories for these families. They even tried to provide somewhat kosher food and build these two rooms in old cemeteries, uh, seminaries. Uh, synagogue and teachers with their mega salaries, they took pay cut to buy clothes to the Jewish children. But most of the Jews from Ajasha moved to Bastia, which was the place for long for stability. And that's one of the largest and busiest ports in France and in Mediterranean. And this is where the only synagogue in Corsica exists, if we don't count Chabad centers. And it was built in 1934. It's mostly closed, open only for holidays, and very few Jews that trace their ancestry to the 1920s, to Tiberias or other places in the Middle East. Only few of them left. And I want to just tell you for a minute about the mystery of Amerta, why Corsica is called the island of the just in Jewish recent history. Bastia was the main port of entry for the French Jews who were seeking asylum. And Corsica became that safe haven because of Corsican heart, always open to persecuted and to the amerta, the code of silence. They would never cooperate with Vichy authorities. And only in 2011, the article published in Le Figaro explained what happened really uh, in Corsica toward the Jews, how they were saved. And the short documentary was created in which documentaries went from village to village, interviewing people. And one man said, yeah, my grandfather, mother, like anybody else in Corsica, she was hiding a Hebrew, but not Hebrew. She was hiding a persecuted person. That's how Corsicans are made, concluded. 
uh, the documentary. And 21st century, very recently in their course, Matin and their magazine editor in chief wrote, Jewish friends, are you living in the France? It's after violent anti-Semitic attacks in France. Come to the island of Corsica and everybody will leave you alone. And Chabad came and they recreated full uh, blown Jewish life that appreciated not just but few Jews in Corsica, but many non-Jews who are happy to come to celebrate in holidays. Hanukkah is every year on the square very close to mansion where Bonaparte was born. And it's done with Muslim community, with a mayor, hundreds and hundreds of people come. So what lessons can we learn from Malta and Corsica? What we remember that first of all, the history of the Jews in Malta and Corsica goes back in Malta to times immemorial and to at least a millennium in Corsica. And both countries were safe haven for Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. Malta is the only country that didn't require visas. And Corsica was the only region in the world where Jewish refugees throughout centuries were never persecuted, but always embraced. And well, see Corsicans never differentiated between the native and foreigners and they hate public displayed religion. Maybe that's why they accepted everyone. They didn't care who you pray to or you don't pray. And the word Jew does not even exist on Corsican language. And now we come into the boot and I hope we have just a few minutes to talk about that. Uh, Calabria, see the end of the boot, just four kilometers separate. Uh, Calabria, the tip of the boot from Sicily. And again, remember who was the first tourist in Corsica and Bonifacio, Homer. And he got us here as well. He described the Straits of Messina and Odyssey about the ship, you know, going between Scylla and Charybdis. You know, it's an Odyssey book 12. Very interesting guy. He goes ahead of us everywhere. Uh, well, the um, Jewish history of Calabria goes back at least to millennium. You know that in Sicily is the oldest Jewish community of Europe, Hellenized Greeks, and most probably they came to Calabria as well, though there are no uh, archaeological evidence of that period. And it most probably were Hellenized Jews that brought Citron or Etrog to Calabria. Now it's the most prized rock for religious in uh, religious people in Israel and used for celebration of Sukkot. I want to take you to a small town Bova Marina. And why? It's a beautiful town like anyone else, any other towns in Corsica. It's embraced by Ionian Sea on one side and wild mountains on another. And little, very little can predict what's going on in this town, that there is a Jewish narrative uh, that um, sh shows that there is interesting story is unfolding. It's an unlikely place to witness, uh, witness Jewish history, but that's where the remains of the old synagogue, the oldest synagogue in Europe, the first, second oldest, first oldest is in uh, Ostia near Rome. And this remains of the synagogue tell you the stories that says as much about the Jewish past as about Jewish future. Here is a synagogue in a beautiful mosaic, Solomon Knot. And on the left, probably remains of Mikva, Rachel Bass. And look on the right, Hupa. That was a wedding in June 2019. The first wedding held at the site of Europe's second oldest synagogue in 1500 years since Talmudic time. And this girl, um, the bride, she is a student of our dear friend, Rabbi Barbara Oyala. Uh, La Mesia Terme is a large town in Calabria that tells interesting Jewish story, entire history. Because they, many people in Calabria are descendants of Jews that were fleeing edict of expulsion and inquisition coming to uh, Calabria, hoping to find safe heaven. They would settle in Reggio in the capital and the coast and position would come here. They would run up to the mountains. 
And this is where they kept their traditions and memory alive, even though they lived the life of Catholics. But many remembered who they are and tried to maintain Jewish religion in their cellars. They're in the middle of the city's monument to Frederick II. Why? He's considered the defender of the Jews only because he was again blood libel. You know, this uh, statement that Jews use the blood of newborns to make them matzah. He wrote to Pope and he made blood libel criminal offense in his lands, which were Sicily, Sardinia, and Calabria. And if you think that this balcony reminds you of those you've seen in Sevilla in Andalusia, it is because the people who built it were those uh, refugees from Inquisition from the south of Spain. And do you see the arch on the left? That's how people coming to La Mesia and other cities south of Italy knew that through this arch they could get into Jewish quarter, old Jewish quarter. In the left, you have a very typical church. What's atypical is look at this rose window. If you think of rose windows of great European churches like Charter Cathedral or Notre Dame, they round. And what this one reminds you of, Jewish star. This used to be a synagogue. And this Jewish quarter uh, sign that was dedicated by the mayor of La Mesia Terme and me and my, our dear friend, Rabbi Barbara Auella. In the Jewish quarter, she, Said, tells fascinating stories of Jewish history of her ancestors. Uh, her father secretly studied with the maestro. Nobody never knew the name of the man who taught him uh, Judaism. What was going on during the war? Racial laws were introduced in Italy in 1938 and segregationist laws uh, Mussolini tried to implement. However, until 1943, until September 1943, when Germany takes over and um, installs uh, the puppet state, Italian socialist country, uh, only then, the uh, deportations took place. Before that, Italy was a relatively safe place for a number of year, European Jews, refugees, and for Italian Jews. So among the 45 population of Jews, about 40,000 Italian Jews, five were refugees from other country, close to 8,000 were exterminated during this time. When you think of Italy, you probably remember that uh, it's, uh, written that usually in Italy were only police and deportation camps. There were no extermination camp. There was only one in Trieste where 3000 Jews were murdered and now it's a memorial. However, there was another camp, a camp like no other and it was in Calabria, Faramonti camp. It was the transitioning camp from which people, 4,000 European Jews and Italian Jews had been sent to concentration camps, but all of them survived due to the hearts and minds and courage of impoverished peasants, Catholic clergy, police, and soldiers. In, in, it was a camp, but it had the library, it had synagogue, few weddings took place. Every family uh, had their separate uh, beds with clean uh, linen provided by the peasants. Children were often taken for pony rides on Sunday or uh, eat some homemade pies or even gelato. There was camp hospital. When the Nazi would come and want to deport the Jews, there was like theater. Uh, the camp uh, inmates under supervision of Catholic clergy coming from nearby villages, they pretended to have typhus or other infectious disease. And there were signs that people behaved like very sick people and the Nazi would leave. So all 4,000 people survived. And Rabbi Barbara, and on this right photo, you can see she's on the left. Uh, she organizes seminars or conferences every year. Of course, this year was, was lost. Bringing survivors from this camp. And here she is with Judith Itzach from Tel Aviv. And Barbara even holds uh, 
Rosh Hashanah services she did uh, last in 2019, uh, last year. And her and our friend, Angela Amata, who is Anusim, new Jew, uh, the woman who discovered her Jewish roots, taken from her 500 years ago and converted to be Jewish. She is playing um, the violin and her son, Alexandra, has uh, a cello. So in Sara Strata Calabria, Barbara built a first and only function in synagogue in the south of Italy in Inquisition times, eternal light of the south. And here we are in the synagogue. And the first bar mitzvah in Calabria, which was in 2016, this little Alessandro, who is now little anymore, became a bar mitzvah and may this be blessed. Uh, there is a, again uh, formed by Barbara and um, different scientists from Italy and South Italy, uh, Italian Jewish Cultural Center of Calabria. What lessons can we learn from this tip of the Italian boot? They present new understanding for us of Jewish history and Jewish identity. The Anusim, and Anusim mean the children of the first one. Those people whose uh, past culture traditions were taken forcefully from them in 1492 and who recently began to rediscover who they are from family stories, family traditions, uh, from some objects that were hidden in the family. And as Barbara says, the unseen descendants whose heritage was so cruelly stolen, hidden and ignored, sustain their history in their flesh and blood. And it is the call of blood that drives a continuously growing number of nay unseen children of the fourth one to force for their, to search for their historical legacy and reclaim it. There is another lesson. It's an unusually optimistic story in the world Jewish narrative. It's a return of the Jew. In response to Holocaust, Faramonti is a camp like no other. There are no formal memorials in Calabria, but this camp museum is a true memorial to the heart and soul of Calabrian people. And now the end. And you can read more stories in my book, and I'm writing a new book now on the stories of Mediterranean. Uh, so we'll be happy to take all your questions, and thank you very much for sticking with me till the end. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we got to uh, hear all of these incredible journeys. I'm looking on the chat, and I actually um, don't see any uh, questions, just one comment about um, Fidel and Yom Kippur services, which I personally found fascinating. I actually did not know Fidel was um, had Jewish ancestors, and I think it's really interesting that he would preserve that piece of himself um, and stand up um, against the Holocaust while also um, being a, a persecutor against people. I think it's an interesting dichotomy, complicated person. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to type anything into the chat or if we're ready to, to go um, right into an informal conversation uh, when that's when we from the museum pop out um, and everyone um, is welcome to just chat with Irene and Alex at your leisure for a few minutes if you're interested. A few you know hours. That, um, we'll stay as long Irene as Irene has want. so many friends. Um, someone is asking, will you post the link? I'm actually going to ask Shober, who's on the line, my um, counterpart, if she would unmute um our friends that everyone can if anyone wants to talk to Irene and Alex we'll have the opportunity um as we wrap up here one second um so um our friends from CLLD are asking um to post a link um 
Hi, 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 Irene. It's Bonnie Sussman. How are you? Oh, Bonnie, where's Jared? <laughs> right over here. Right here. This was fabulous. We want the link. And you will, and you can invite all your Kulanu members yeah. for the link. I know Rabbi Barbara very well. She's on the Kulanu board. Oh. She is. Oh, yes. And yes, I will be doing a talk. Barbara invited me to do a talk for their cultural center on Sicily, Sardinia, and Calabria. And so I will talk to Italian and American and international audience. Okay. That was terrific. We're going to leave. Thank you. you. Thank you, okay. Bonnie. Great to see you, Thank and Jerry. You. Likewise. Likewise. Thank we you. do have an interesting comment from iPad 7 um, asking if it's possible to take a Jewish tour to the these areas um, and, and complimenting you, Irene, an excellent program about a little known area of the world. I mean, I know it made me want to visit for sure. I feel like we all, as soon as we should get on a plane, like why not go there of all the places we can go, places where they welcome us with open arms and um, let's support their economy, right? Um, the, um, the question though about taking a Jewish tour is interesting. I mean, of course, wouldn't it be cool if we could organize our own Maltz Museum tour with you? That would be so cool. Um, but that aside, are there Jewish tour, you know, can you, are there organized Jewish tours of these areas that exist already? Talking about Calabria or Italy as a whole, yes. But the tours are like separate islands within the boot. There is tour of Rome, by Michael, a good friend of mine, she does excellent tour of Jewish Rome. Uh, Barbara Oella does south of Italy. Concerning Malta and Corsica, no. What I'm doing now when I'm writing my book, I'm doing appendices that would be exactly its Jewish guides. What to see and why, because it's, you have a sense, it's very different area. It's a uh, world apart. It's not like you're doing Jewish tour of Rome, come to Ruda Temple, that's where Jews were born, and that's a synagogue, and there's a Holocaust Museum. There is none. You know, Corsica was such a special place for us. When Alex and I traveled through Central Europe, we come to Austria, come to Germany, I always have this thought in my head, looking at um, middle-aged people, or elderly people, who were they, their parents or grandparents during the war. In Corsica, everybody we looked at these people or their parents and grandparents are those oh. who welcome the Jews. Is it my computer so or did we just freeze? You lost me or can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if it was my computer. I never know, right? Like, is it me? Is it something else? So I just probably should have waited it out, but. <laughs> So uh, my book will um, be guide for Jewish maybe, history of Corsica um, in specific case, didn't... places. And the same about Malta, specific place. After you read the chapter on this part and then the guide, the place, why go there, what would you learn? So with definition, why, and, um, and the location. Can you, can you hear me or I do, uh, I'm muted? It seems like... So, You're not muted. I think there was just a little, for me, there was a little interference, but it could have been my computer. Um, so that's so exciting that you're creating these Jewish travel guides in these unknown parts of the world. That's exciting. Not unknown yeah, parts, right. there's little known. Little known, right. Little known, right. yeah. Especially are... for us, for American globe trotters, you know, I know very few people who even thought about going to Malta. Where is Malta and is it country or is it colony and going to Corsica. And for people who like outdoors, it's heaven, forget history, just climb the mountains. <laughs> That's so wonderful. So in, we're approaching 8.30. So um, I think it's time for the museum to call it a night. We're going to wrap it up. Um, we will leave the line open for um, a little bit longer. Um, so that everyone can chat openly with Irene for a little bit, um, but we will formally close the program. Um, it looks like you have another question coming in though, and um, it's why Jews assimilated in Malta and Corsica? Well, let so, me know. start with Corsica. You know, the Jews that came in the ninth century from Egypt, it's known that there were thousands 
uh, at least thousands of families coming. If you remember the map, if you don't trust me, it's on kind of on the middle of the eastern part, Porto Vecchio, beautiful, beautiful city. They came there, did not stay there. It's documented, recorded. They almost immediately rushed up the mountains. Who were they running from? We don't know. What we do know that these people wrote and spoke Hebrew because the ancient Hebrew documents in churches in the village called Levi, and then they disappeared. And then the same outcome from the next wave after the uh, edict of expulsion, people melt into the mountain villages. And then after Padua pogroms, and Padua was part of Venus Republic, and we know Venice's attitude towards the Jews, read Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice. So the same, only the name stays. And even in El Rus, that named El Rus because of the Jews, the natives had difficulties pronouncing the names of the Jews coming from Italy and Catalonia, but many of them, it's, it's at least it's stated that they had read here, like me. No highlights so. though. And uh, so they called them a ruse, meaning like redheaded. They also melted, you know. So why? Was it because of Corsican aversion to any public display of religion? Was it because of they were so welcoming, people felt at home, was very difficult to maintain Judaism, strict laws, and they were separated from the rest of communities? But who knows? But what speaks about Corsican soul, it's what the role they played during the Holocaust. And I think it's incredible story. And Corsica submitted official request to Yad Vashem, a museum and center dedicated to Holocaust in Jerusalem, submitted request for Corsica to be an island of, uh, if there's, um, the the, uh, no, uh, the Gentiles, what they call this, uh, they recognize that the special island that saved the Jews. And I don't know what happened to this request. We know that Denmark is the only country recognized, but in you know, Corsica is not the country, they're officially part of France, but it's definite that that's what people did. So it's, uh, but now Judaism is alive and well because of Chabad. And they accept everyone. Everyone could just come and say, you know, I think my grand grandparents were Jewish and my name is Simeoni, whether it's biblical or it's not. And I want to come, okay, come, you know, learn from us, let's stay for the services, go to school. There are many children coming to school. They have over hundred children. Some of them not Jewish at all, but parents send them there, learn about Judaism. So it's it, it's an interesting story, I mean, and and Malta you. is different. You know, this Jewish population during Renaissance, during Knights of Malta, were slaves, protected by Inquisition because Inquisition was very different in Malta. But now they have small Jewish community, about two hundred families, very active, very vibrant. There is Chabad also, but Chabad are Jews in Malta. They function for people who come in to visit, who want their wonderful restaurant, La Chaim. Everybody likes this restaurant, very Israeli. But there are Jews of Malta. And they had, you know, their services interesting. They're Sephardic style services, but they use Ashkenazi's prayer books. I think only in Malta they do this kind of things. I just wrote a note, Irene, thank you. I'm hopping off. You are now the host. You're welcome to stay and chat with any of your um, interested guests and, and friends thank and you. followers. Thank you, um, I wanted to take you. one more second to thank the Holocaust and Humanities Center, who's a partner with us. Um, please remember that we are um, entering into this really important partnership, um, which expands Holocaust education across the state of Ohio. Um, and, you know, they're, um, they run a significant amount of programming that we're amplifying here, um, and our programming tonight is also amplified in Cincinnati, and so that really stretches our reach and expands Holocaust knowledge and education. That's fantastic and that you have partners like that. Lowers boundaries to access and, and, and 
um, or visit our Stop the Hate Ohio Jetboard website. I'm going to say goodbye and Irene, enjoy the rest of your night and thank you to all of our guests. Thank you, Dalia.